Thank you. And I've been asked to close this out, so I'll wrap the answer in that. Um, so I want to thank you, Naomi, thank uh, Nancy, Chris, Esteban, uh, Nora, and of course, Kathy, thank you so much for for holding us. And thank you all for joining us. Um, so if you're coming out of this conversation alarmed, good. Yeah. Our conditions are alarming. Uh, the connection between climate change induced migration from poor, predominantly black and brown countries with ascending white nationalism in Europe and the European settler colonies foretells a future of climate catastrophe, democratic collapse, and possibly globalized race war. If Trump's right-wing populism appeared for a time to at least partly speak to genuine economic hardship, ever since he turned his policy again over to Paul, Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and an army of corporate lobbyists, he has revealed in himself surely to be motivated only by two things. First of all, his own personal enrichment, right? And secondly, a fulminating white grievance politics anchored in ideas about white replacement that shade easily into open white supremacism. For Trump and for other right-wing parties across the globe, their populism increasingly assumes overtly racist forms, often in the guise of so-called welfare chauvinism. That is, a blatant ranking of human life based on race and citizenship status. White nationalism will take the reality of nature's limits as an argument for us to use the force in order to hoard whatever resources we can command. And this is echo fascism. It will threaten wars, especially with China, and that's happening now. And while it may still traffic in denunciations of shadowy, presumably Jewish, globalist elite, it will not offer any material improvements in, in its constituents' lives. Instead, it will offer the psychic compensations of racial and gender violence. Unless they are interrupted, white nationalism combined with the intensification of the climate and migration crisis will lead more and more to authoritarian rule and the militarized nature of everyday life. With dire consequences for those of us who are either marked as outsiders from the start or choose never to submit to live under the system. All the while, the billionaires will continue their work. They will sooner invest in private armies and marching colonies and consent to their wealth being appropriated for the sake of the planet and the people on it. We know that centrism cannot save us. Even as most mainstream democratic politicians come to release the realization that neoliberalism is an electoral dead end, they continue to play to elite audiences. What for them past as bold ideas wouldn't alter the reality of diminished life prospects for the majority of the US population. And voters are not done. We are not done. We see this. If we have four years of democratic control, so that means Trump is defeated, and no significant material improvement in the lives of most Americans, it could easily be followed by a right wing presidency, even scarier than the one we currently have, since that right wing presidency likely would be confident. <laughs> in this context, those of us who consider ourselves part of the left need to be very clear about our tasks. The role of the left isn't simply to consolidate the left. The role of the left is to organize the working class. So the task of the left at this juncture is to build and lead the broadest possible front of popular forces in a project of transforming the American state from one organized around capital accumulation without limit to one organized around mobilizing our collective capacities to green the earth and ensure the well-being of all people. We need to transform our nation with a politics rooted in dignity and solidarity and generosity and, yes, love, not greed and division, hate, extraction, and war. A nation where every single one of us can thrive should be our common sense and our North Star. At least one path may get us there, the multiracial populism. I think Esteban, you're talking about this multiracial alignment that we need to build. What populism means to me is that we should be working to build broad normal majorities around a political program that directly challenges the power of the ruling class 
and their white Christian nationalist ally and points towards liberation for everyone. I think, I think we build durable majority by offering clear solutions to real problems in people's lives. So the fact that we're talking about wiping out student debt, the fact that we're talking about a Green New Deal, the fact that we're talking about abolishing private health care, these are opportunities to bring working people into the door. But then we have a second duty. Once folks get in the door, we need to do something that the right has done for, for much better and for decades, which is to invest in our people's political education over the long term. People know that things are badly broken, but we must help them create the conditions so that they can understand how and why and what to do about it. One of the things that we at the Working Families Party are working to do is to educate people about the greatest political challenges that we face, which is the greatest political challenge of our life and of our people's lives for generations, racial capitalism. This term gets invoked more and more, but not always with precision. My own view is that racial capitalism is a system in which race functions to establish material and status hierarchies within the broad working class. Specifically under racial capitalism, all workers are exploited, all of us across race. But black and brown workers are exploited, excluded, surveilled, dispossessed, incarcerated, sometimes killed. White workers are treated as full citizens at least, with protection of laws, and large apparatuses devoted to facilitating the participation in at least some of the material benefits of American capitalism. The material discrepancies that I talked about are vast and they build over generations. Witness the racial wealth class that, uh, gap that we talked about. But they are also, they also generate particular political pathologies. Specifically, they give rise to the profound conviction on the part of many, many white Americans that any program that will uplift all working class people must inevitably come at their expense. This fear that equality for all represents a loss for some, even if it would make them materially better off, is an acute challenge for all of us, everybody that's trying to organize a multiracial movement, especially when the majority of white Americans are seeing their living standards erode. Under racial capitalism, the solidarities of whiteness and patriarchy, saturated with chauvinistic nationalism, always potentially compete with the solidarity of in this open, in his open invitation, Trump open invitation to participate in the solidarity of whiteness, Trump has exploited this blatant possibility like few other politicians in our history. And in the process, he has shown just how powerful it really can be. Its appeal, the solidarity of whiteness, its appeal cuts right through the electoral coalition that many of us are trying to build through Nikki Kendra's campaign. And we have to figure out this vexing organizing challenge. To me, the multiracial part of multiracial populism means that we will only build a powerful working class majority in this country by talking honestly about race and racism and not avoiding the subject. My friend Heather McGee makes this point with a memorable story. In the South, during the Civil Rights era, segregationists defunded, drained, and closed the public swimming pools rather than allow black people to swim together with whites. Now, no one could swim in them, white or black. These pools, literally and metaphorically, have never been refilled. Now only the wealthy with a private pool or a country club can go swimming in. This happens all the time in less visible ways, and when we talk to white people about it, they know it's true because they too have suffered the consequences of this decades-long program of starving public goods for private gain. When we are silent and people are insecure, scared about what their slice might look like as the pie shrinks, the outcome isn't good for our side. We have no choice but to expose the right's racist tactics to show how they've been used to divide and conquer and to drain the public pool for all of us. They say there isn't enough to go around and someone else might get their share. If we don't address it with our own story, theirs will prevail. We need to tell our story how they are stealing what belongs to all of us, our public good, and putting us against one another so that we could annoy, so that we could ignore what is common amongst all of us. This is a political tactic of the right. And the only way we could
the challenges by confronting white supremacy. The good news is that this political moment, for all of its dangers, created unusually favorable conditions. The Trump presidency has radicalized liberals and electoralized radicals. <laughs> yeah, this, this space is a case of point. And my own view is that we need to marry the creative brilliance of movements, their ability to render the invisible visible and make the impossible possible with the power, rigor, and leadership development of labor and people's organizations. And that's what makes what's happening right now in, in Philadelphia so exciting. Y'all are doing that. This is why the work that's happening in Philadelphia is a national priority, for example, the work of families part of. We, we need, need, need to give that marriage a political home, build on deep trust that can bring our whole self into that, that picture. That doesn't ask anybody to sacrifice your politics. That home needs to be a place where all of these forces can fashion non-delusional strategies for winning elections everywhere in America. That is, in any event, what we're aspiring at least to do at the Work of Families Party. Now, we leave the lack to deny that there are built-in contradictions to such an enterprise. But in the case of Pender Books and Nicholas Award, wherever you are, okay, are two, yeah. Are two at-large candidates for Philly, you have two brilliant examples of what all of that might look like. Not just here in Philadelphia, but all over the country. Candidates who are fighting to bring the Green New Deal local through transformational climate ordinances. Candidates who, and this is key, are building the kind of grassroots infrastructure in Pennsylvania that we talked about, that we know will defeat Trumpism in 2020. So I want to thank you so much.